One of the areas where company accounts can be most useful journalistically is in identifying relationships and potential conflicts of interest. In this video, I'm going to cover where to find those potential conflicts of interest, some techniques for following those up and how to report the sorts of stories you might get from that information, and why it's journalistically useful to know what and who the ultimate controlling party is, another piece of jargon you'll come across in company accounts. I'll start with this example. Um, this is uh, Urban Outreach, is a charity, a homeless charity, that um, I was talking uh, with a relative about. They'd had a quite a negative experience with this charity, so I thought I'd start digging around in their company accounts. And the first place that I went to, which is the first place I always go to in company accounts, is the very last page. Because on the last page of the accounts, you'll find related party transactions. And related party transactions are any transactions that involve um, companies or people that are related to the people making the decisions, the directors of the company in question. Now at this charity, there were a couple of these related party transactions. Um, the first was to a couple of relatives of one of the trustees. So it seems that um, a couple of those relatives were paid maybe to do some work. The second was uh, another trustee. Basically, the charity had subscribed to a bond which was related to a building project that this trustee was connected to. Now, although the employment of relatives might seem perhaps more interesting, uh, generally speaking, the numbers involved, the amounts of money involved, were not very big, whereas the bond was £85,000. So, this made me quite curious, and the first question I had to ask was, have I found a conflict of interest on the very last page? The first thing here is the idea of bonds. What is a bond? I don't know. So I need to go off and find out. I need to find out specifically if this is a potential problem. Should charities be investing money in bonds. Are bonds a safe place to put your money or are they a risky place to put your money? Well, it doesn't look particularly good when you look into bonds. It doesn't seem like a uh, perhaps the safest place to put your money and there is a risk that the charity could lose this money, which ultimately is money that's been donated by um, donors or given by um, local councils, which in turn are funded by taxpayers. So the first thing here is to establish, is there a potential story in, in terms of this being problematic? Then we start to look at the person, Sam Lancaster. This is the, the trustee who, um, who had this potential conflict of interest, who was connected with both the charity and the building company that was being loaned money by the charity. Now, searching for his name on Company's House, something I'll come on to later, brings up a number of different results. And you'll notice that all of them have got the same month of birth, June 1952, and quite a few of them have similar addresses as well. This isn't actually a suspicious thing. This is very common on Company's House because if you enter your details with any sort of difference um, on different occasions, then it will treat those as different Sam Lancasters, if you, if you like, it will create a new account. So in this case, we've got the same person, but they have a number of different accounts on the system, probably because they moved or possibly even just typed something slightly different. But what this does mean journalistically is I need to look at all these entries to compile a full picture of this person's interest. In the process of doing that, I found that not only did he have the directorship in Woodlands Care, the, the company building the project, which was declared in the um, company accounts. But they're also a director of Coefficient Care Bonds Limited, which is the company administering the bond. And they were appointed before the accounts that I'm looking at. Now, if I go back to those accounts, if I go to back to this statement, we'll see it says here's a director in Woodlands Care but it doesn't mention that he's a director in Coefficient Care Bonds Limited, which is basically operating this uh, bond scheme. 
So not only do we have a, a declared conflict of interest, we also have an undeclared conflict of interest here as well. We can do some further research because this is a charity by looking on the Charity Commission website. This also has some extra information about the people and other, other data related to any sort of charity. And in this case, we can look at the Board of Trustees and we can look at Sam Lancaster and other charities that he is connected with. So this gives us another interest as well, although in this case, it's not related to necessarily the, the story we're interested in. The final story then is this, or at least this was the first of a couple of stories on this potential conflict of interest. The first thing you'll probably notice is that the headline is very straight, it's very factual. We've decided in this case to um, not, uh, to basically hold back and be, be very careful about not raising any issues of defamation. Because remember here that we've not proved any wrongdoing, we've only identified some potentially worrying behaviour. So um, the lead to the story is a little bit stronger. A Bolton charity has defended its investment in a care home company with links to one of its trustees. And sometimes some news organisations might decide to lead a headline on something similar. But in this case, they've been a bit more cautious because even this might, in a headline, imply something um, that, that might be hard to defend in court. So they've been very factual. They said, here's the facts. Um, and they've left the reader to decide whether this is perhaps um, behaviour that they might not be happy with. And this might be quite common in a story where, if that's all you can find out, that there is a conflict of interest, that concerns are being re raised about it, um, that might be what the story stays as. The other thing that would happen, as happened here, is you would contact the Charity Commission, for example, and ask them, is this something that they would investigate? And if they do decide to investigate it, then that gives you another story. In this case, they did investigate, which led to a second story when basically the Charity Commission um, decided not to pursue this any further. But one thing you ought to, ought to remember is that even if no action takes place, the action of scrutiny, the knowledge that this is being scrutinised, is still a really vital part of what journalism does. Sometimes it's not the spectacular results of laws being changed or people being arrested and convicted that's, that's the impact of journalism. Research has shown that corruption is lower in areas with a local newspaper, um, and the theory is that the, the, at least part of this is the awareness that you are being scrutinised. So here we've dealt with related party transactions. As I said, this is at the very end of an annual uh, report or a company's accounts. And not only does it identify transactions between uh, companies, but it can identify sister companies as well. It's sometimes a place where you might find mentions of license payments to sister company, companies. This is um, one way that some companies avoid tax or extract wealth from one country into another. One thing to consider in this section is that there might be information missing. For example, in the story I've just talked about, one of the relationships was not declared and it should have been. Also, this is generally a starting point rather than the end point. It raises questions which you can then go and ask to tell the story. And obviously one of the organisations that you should ask before publishing is the company itself to explain and have a right of reply around um, any concerns or suspicions that are being raised. Here's another example. This is from a school's academy trust. In this case, the trust sold a car to one of its head teachers for just £4,000. Now, again, this is a good example of a question that's being raised. Why, you know, was this uh, um, sold too cheaply? Um, but we need to ask further questions to find out. The obvious question to begin with would be what car it was, if it was a, an old banger that... Um, was barely drivable, then that's going to be very different from a Lamborghini. So once we get the answers to those questions, we can start to build an idea of the story that we might have, or we might decide that there is no story here. That happens all the time. 
Knowing how to look at directors is a useful skill in relation to this and indeed uh, using company accounts more generally in journalism. One of the things that you will find on Companies House, where all the company accounts are published, is a list of the directors of a company and the people with significant control. This is useful to build a picture of who's connected to which companies and which com companies are connected to which companies as well. Those connections represent interests and that's where we might get a conflict of interests. Remember, as we've seen with the example Sam Lancaster I've just gone through, is that there can be other versions of the same person on Companies House, so you need to make sure you've got all of those accounts collected to give you a full picture. And it's worth searching for variations of the name, so you know, missing out middle names, um, to see if you pick up other versions of the same person. And also, this will often give you a clue to other companies in a group because one director, uh, the, the same director, is often a director of multiple companies in a group of companies that are all connected to each other. Let's uh, work for an example. I want to show you this in practice with um, Victoria Beckham. And I'll start, let's go to this page here. This is Companies House. Um, the address, there's a very long address now, find and update company information service.gov.uk, but you can find it by just searching for Companies House on Google, and you'll get taken to a search uh, box like this to search for register of companies. Now, a good place to start if you're looking into a person is with a company that you're, you know they're definitely connected with. If we're looking at Victoria Beckham, we're going to profile Victoria Beckham's business interests, then one of the obvious places to start is Victoria Beckham Limited, if we know that she's already connected to this company. Once you search for the company, you'll get to the company page and you'll notice a number of different tabs for that company, including filing history, which is where the accounts and other filings can be found, and people. Now people is where we should find Victoria Beckham herself. So we'll need to scroll down a little bit and then we come to Beckham, Victoria, Caroline. So we've got a middle name now and we've also got a link here which should take us to a page of all her other directorships on Companies House. There are 11 directorships listed here. If we tick current appointments, that number will reduce to, four, uh, to seven. Um, so we can basically work out that four of those directorships, four of those appointments, are old appointments, not current. That might be because the business folded or was closed. It might be because she left the business. But this tells us the directorships that she had. Or at least it tells us the directorships that this particular version of Victoria Beckham has on Company's House. The next step is to copy that name and search for it on Companies House as a whole to see if there are any other versions of this person. When we do that, we see that there are um, a number. And in fact, what we need to do is make sure that we're clicking on officers. So we're only looking at people, not companies. And so we can see that there are a number of Victoria Caroline Beckhams. There are also these, um, these are actually companies, but they are officers in companies, which we won't get bogged down in right now. But this is what we're interested in, Victoria Beckham. So we can see that in addition to the one that we just were in, uh, which I think is this third one, yeah, the third one, this is the one we were just looking at, there are two others as well. And if we click through to those, we'll see um, this one is a director of Victoria Beckham Beauty UK and the other one is also a director of Victoria Beckham Beauty UK Limited, which is a bit confusing. Uh, and in fact, let's click through and see if there are two Victoria Beckhams. There's one. And no, for some reason, this person has been entered twice. It may be that, the, that, she, that she changed address um, and one is active and one is not. But that's the process to go through when you're trying to 
understand the connections of an individual in terms of the companies that they're connected to. In this case, you might then start to um, try just Victoria Beckham without the middle name, and there aren't any others. You might also look for the, the address. You might look for fellow directors on those companies and start to expand the network further. You'll find screenshots of this process in the slides for this presentation, so I'm just going to skip through those to the next part. So having mapped the business connections of a particular director, you might also want to check if they're declaring their interests elsewhere, uh, particularly if this is someone in a position of power. Now, Victoria Beckham isn't someone who's going to be a councillor or a governor necessarily, um, but if you're looking at a website, let's go to this school. Uh, schools and councils, if you are in a position of power in those uh, organisations, then you are supposed to declare your interest. And normally you have to dig around a little bit. So if I go to the menu, I'm going to go to About Us. And um, let's just go back and do the drop down. Uh, and Governance is what I'm interested in. How is this governed? Who are the governors? And as you scroll down, you will eventually find Let's just carry on down here. Where's it gone? <laughs> Register of business interests, here we go. Right. So this is very small, so you can't see what it looks like, but I'm gonna switch back to the slides so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, what we have here is a declaration of interest. When you're in one of these positions of power, you're supposed to declare any interest which may conflict with the power that you're holding. So in a, at a school, obviously, you have power over quite large budgets. Likewise, if you're a councillor at a council, you don't want to be giving those budgets to your own companies without people being aware of that at the very least and being able to question that and go through a proper process. So here's what the register of the, the declaration of interest looked like a few years ago. Um, we can look at that company on Companies House and we can check. Now notice here, Peter Davis has uh, no relevant pecuniary interest. So he's basically not declaring any interests on that declaration of interests. But if we go even just on Companies House and find Peter in that company, the Viners Learning Trust and Academy Trust, we'll see he has lots of interests um, in all sorts of different companies. So these are interests that he should have declared uh, for the school. And the story that, that um, in this case, the story was about whether they even had declarations of interest. But again, you might want to ask um, why he's not declaring them. The final thing that I want to briefly touch on then is um, this idea of the ultimate controlling party. Also at the end of the uh, accounts, you'll find a line in the accounts that specifies which company ultimately controls the company that you're looking at. Uh, this may not be the same as the owners of the company. It might be further down the chain of ownership. And it may be people who own controlling voting shares, for example. Now, um, here are a couple of examples just to show you what I mean. The first is from Facebook. So you can see immediate parent undertaking and ultimate controlling party is the name of the section. And you can see that the immediate parent is Facebook Global Holdings 2 LLC. And the ultimate parent is Facebook Inc. So in other words, uh, Facebook Global Holdings 2 owns Facebook UK, but that in turn is, own, is owned by other companies which eventually lead to Facebook Inc which owns all of the companies above this one. Another example here is Aston Villa. Uh, football clubs are a good example for this because they, um, they, they are kind of seen as basically you know, owned by the local community whereas in fact the reality is that many of them, oops I'll call back, many of them are owned overseas 
sometimes in tax havens. So in this case, uh, we have the company's controlling party to be this company, NSWESCS, which is registered in Luxembourg. Um, and uh, the immediate parent is Recon Sports Limited. So um, where this might be interested in, interesting is if the place that the, the ultimate parent, con, com, parent company is registered, if that's registered in a tax haven, a non-tax haven. And in the slides to this video, you'll find another video, an interview with George Turner from the Tax Justice Network, talking very briefly about the uh, offshore game, which was a project to map offshore ownership of um, UK football clubs and, and how many of those were in tax havens. Um, and he talks about that in the video in the slides. But I just want to briefly draw your attention to the ultimate controlling party as one other important and useful piece of information at the end of a company's accounts. So some key points to round up from that video. First of all, look for potential conflicts of interest and the ultimate controlling party on the last page of the accounts. Both of these can be quite useful as leads for stories. Also, research directors to find connections that might form the basis of questions and give you a bigger picture to the questions that you're asking. More broadly, connections between directors can themselves be a story. You can do a, an explanatory or exploratory story about the network around a particular individual or a particular company. It's certainly been done many times with Donald Trump and his various business interests. Uh, you could do it with pop stars. You could do it with other major figures. And consider what the story might be. Some obvious basic ones to fall back on are concerns being raised over what you've found, the company defending itself against it, or even actions being taken when you draw certain authorities' attention to it. Remember, however, to always be careful about defamation and libel. Um, do not imply that someone is involved in wrongdoing if you do not have proof of that. You can only state the facts. But the facts alone are often newsworthy enough. You'll find some exercises on Moodle and in the GitHub repo in the accounts folder um, to explore some, some of these techniques and some of the other techniques that we've covered in this series of videos.